Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. Mike Tyson is not on this list because he was a sleeper agent planted into DX by genius tactician Stone Cold Steve Austin. He was in deep cover. He never stopped being face. The truth is out there, people. Wake up. WWE has a checkered history with celebrities. On one hand, they literally launched themselves as a global brand off the back of Mr. T. But on the other hand, Jeremy Piven. What tends to remain constant, though, is that the celebrities are almost always portrayed as the baby face when they show up. Hooray, says WWE falling to its knees and slobbering all over the feet of Toby Keith. All herald the famous man. The endless stream of deference gets super tiresome, which is why sometimes it's refreshing when a celebrity guests on the show and purposefully plays the heel. It's rare, but hey, turns out there are more dislikable celebrities out there than you might think. Here are 12 celebrities who played the wrestling heel. Number 12, Pete Rose. You've got to love the fact that Pete Rose didn't even try to play face when he arrived at WrestleMania 14. The ex-Cincinnati Reds player and manager arrived in Boston as guest ring announcer and literally the first thing he said is, last time we were here, we kicked your ass before launching into a tight five that can best be summed up by his closer, the City of Losers. How about it? Pete's spitting of hot fire naturally summons Kane, who tombstones him in the first of the Pete Rose WrestleMania trilogy. At Mania 15, Pete Rose turned up in a chicken suit to try and revenge himself on Kane and ate another tombstone before at WrestleMania 2000 he used a decoy chicken suit to try and attack Kane before getting choke slammed and suffering a stink face. Looking forward to Mania 37 where Pete Rose uses the Ocean's Eleven team to heist Knox County City Hall and Kane just hits him with his Vauxhall Vectra. Number 11, Ennis Cantor. Speaking of sportsmen who do the sports in the city that isn't the city that WWE is currently in and therefore they have the same morality as a murderer, Ennis Cantor, the first of two large sporting men to win the WWE 24-7 title. In a WWE.com exclusive as part of main event, which is as dark as a WWE segment can get outside a fight happening between dads in the f***ing parking lot, former New York Knicks basketballsman Ennis Cantor took to the ring to be interviewed by Charlie Caruso, receiving a wall of booze because this was happening in Madison Square Garden and Cantor had defected to the hated Boston Celtics. 24-7 champion and world's happiest idiot R-Truth came out to defend Cantor, who then pie-faced him to the ground and pinned him for the title before opening opening his hoodie to reveal a Celtic vest in a New York ring. Beautiful. Number 10, Morton Downey Jr. Whenever a celebrity steps into the ring with a wrestler that you like, you tend to shrink in your chair because there's nothing WWE likes more than punking out their talented athletes on the gothic altar of fame. Snoop Dogg double leg took down Chavo Guerrero, then danced with the ladies. Hugh Jackman punched Dolph Ziggler, then came back to Roar, and because Dolph happened to be faced this time, he hip tossed Damien Sandow with the help of Dolph because sod it. Hooray, the famous man. When Roddy Piper got in the ring with Morton Downey Jr at Mania 5, similar apprehensions were had. Downey Jr.'s cable show was crude, involved a lot of shouting, was the father of trash TV, all things that tickle Vince's pickle. One of Downey Jr.'s gimmicks was blowing smoke in his guest's face, and he repeatedly did that to the hot rod during their in-ring segment, prompting boos from the crowd. Credit to Downey Jr. that he actually agreed to get some rare in-ring comeuppance when Piper sprayed him with a fire extinguisher to make an iconic Mania memory. Number 9, Pat McAfee, Mr. NXT himself. Nothing's more traditional traditional black and gold brand than a celebrity match at a takeover, is it? I mean, as fitting as it is that in 2020, the cursed year, we're getting ex-footballing podcaster Pat McAfee battling, checks notes, the longest reigning NXT champion of all time, Adam Cole, at a f***ing takeover of all places. There are at least some clever NXT things happening here. First of all, this is a feud that's actually been subtly bubbling away for two years, and also, the celebrity outsider playing dress-up in wrestling's world is the official heel. Formerly an American footballer, which my friends tell me is like a rug be player but in body armor because he's a Jesse, McAfee did some guest announcing on NXT and kept making short jokes at Cole's expense. The two men got into it before Pat straight up punted Adam Cole as he was trying to climb over the announce table before then accepting a match with him and saying he was going to dance on the grave of NXT. It's odd, it's not exactly the flavour of sports entertainment that NXT fans are used to, but hey, at least they got the alignments right. This list will be recorded and edited before the match actually happens, but gosh, I hope Adam Cole won. Number eight, K-Fed. Because yeah, sometimes a dickhead celebrity gets the pin. Kevin Fedline, famous for his no songs and for somehow making white people rapping uncool, took to Monday Night Raw in 2006 to promote his no songs and get into beef with fellow thug-tinged gentleman John Cena. It was the rap dream match we never knew we didn't want, and K-Fed played the swaggering asshole heel to an uncanny degree of success. To be completely fair, apparently everyone backstage at WWE liked working with K-Fed. He acted like a professional, which explains why his run with WWE 
Wii actually lasted longer than most people remember. He appeared in October 2006 before actually interfering in a Cena match on pay-per-view at Cyber Sunday before hyping a match with Cena almost two months in advance. K-Fed and Jay Cena wrestled on New Year's Day 2007, with Fedline being such an effective heel that people actually stopped booing Cena for a change. Unfortunately, thanks to interference from Umaga, Cena was actually pinned by Britney Spears' then-husband, and if something like that happens in McAfee Cole, I will proudly and happily walk into the sea. Number seven, Dennis Rodman. We can have a go at WWE for their long-running courtship of celebrities, but no one suckled harder at the withered tea to pop culture than WCW. The Mozarts of shit celebrity angles, Dubsy Dubs saw appearances from Jay Leno, Chucky, Robocop, a certain world champion that don't worry we'll get to, the insane clown posse, Kiss and their demon, Chuck Norris, John Claude Van Double Denim, Master P, Will Sasso wrestling Bret Hart, the list goes on, but their most iconic celebrity has to be Crazy Basketball's and Kim Jong-un's mate, Dennis Rodman. A bad boy of the basketball scene, Rodman hooked up with the NWO in 1997 and worked with the company for two years, wrestling four matches for the company, including a singles match against Types Into Calculator. Randy Savage, WCW, your big mental money burners. Rodman relished the image boost that hanging with the New World Order gave him and healed it up with all the gusto one can expect from a lunatic whose idea of a fun night out is karaoke with a terrifying dictator. Number six, Colin Jost and Michael Shea. Looking back, I actually quite like what the SNL funny men brought to WrestleMania 35's Andre Battle Royal. They hid during the match itself so they didn't gum up any spots for the actual wrestlers, had an obnoxious therapist spot that trolled the fans just long enough before giving the entire industry a heart murmur when it looked like Colin Jost was actually going to win the whole thing. But then he didn't and got sh can for being a little sneak. Did it add a single buy to WrestleMania? It did not. Did anyone really benefit from the interaction? I mean, that therapist guy got paid. I guess. It was a throwaway skit that added a dash of colour to an otherwise throwaway match, but at least WWE didn't insult our intelligence by pretending we'd be happy to see a pair of pencil neck comedians win the whole thing. After years of Hugh Jackman and Snoop Dogg hearing Aiden English saying, show them what we do to intruders as Colin Jost is manhandled, it's some sort of progress. Number five, Mr. Pac-Man Jones. What's better than a non-wrestling celebrity winning a title? A non-wrestling celebrity winning a title without wrestling because he's not allowed to. In 2007, Adam Pacman Jones, a footballsman, was suspended from playing for a year after an incident at a strip club that saw Pacman assault a stripper and one of his entourage fire a f***ing gun into a crowd. TNA saw a big pile of money they could set fire to and brought Jones in for a run with the company. However, after signing him, TNA realised that legally Pacman couldn't wrestle because of an injunction from the Tennessee Titans, so they had to turn Pacman heel, though the fans hated him from the start, and make him a cowardly part of a heel stable called Team Pacman with Ron R-Truth killings. At no surrender that year, Team Pac-Man won the TNA tag titles with Jones getting the pin on Sting without ever hitting a move. Team Pac-Man then lost the titles at Bound for Glory without Pac-Man even being in the match because they brought in consequences Xavier Woods Creed in to fill his spot. Then Pac-Man went away. Good job, everyone. Number four, Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is a funny man. Jon Stewart does a fair amount of good in this world. Jon Stewart ruined two SummerSlam matches. In 20 2015, John Cena was wrestling Seth Rollins in a champion versus champion winner-take-all match for the US and WWE championships. Now, if you heard that pitch and thought, well, I sure hope the former host of The Daily Show gets involved in that somehow, then good news, WWE creative are hiring. Towards the end of the match, which by the way was just heartbreakingly good, Cena and Rollins always did great work together, but Seth goes full White Ranger and levels up times a million. What made it all the more WWE was when Jon Stewart, and I say this with infinite air quotes, Swerve does by hitting Cena with a chair to prevent him from tying Rick Flair's world championship record because Jon Stewart super likes Ric Flair. The live crowd flipped their lid for it because it was a real anti-Cena house, but looking back, just wrestling. Then the next year, Jon Stewart wore a unicorn horn, got in the ring against Anderson and Gallows, tucked his shirt in for no reason, then danced after Biggie, gargled some piss, and no part of that sentence was a lie. Number three, Floyd Mayweather. Sometimes you turn someone heel to shock the world, and sometimes you turn someone heel because there's so much of an objectionable bell jar that the fans cannot compute cheering for them. See also Skinny Jeans Batista, Seth Rollins' Twitter account, and Floyd Money Mayweather, who was supposed to be the underdog face in a mania match against the Big Show, but then the fans 
once met him. In the real world, the man was already working a kind of wrestling angle of his own, adopting the money Mayweather purposefully heel public persona, acting like a dick on purpose, because he figured that way people would be more likely to pay for a pay-per-view fight to see him get the crap kicked out of him. WWE originally presented him as a bland face, thanking the fans, best friend of Rey Mysterio, who knows everyone in combat sports, apparently. But then Mayweather broke Big Show's nose, Cockley ran around with an entourage, and actually went off script during a WWE press conference going full money Mayweather, telling the fans that he was running the show. Galvanized by his healing, the actual match at Mania is probably still the best celebrity match WWE ever did, so maybe Floyd was right that him being a prick makes him more interesting to watch. Number two, David Arquette. Oh no. What more is there to be said about David Arquette winning the WCW Championship? 2000 was an amazing year for WWE and just the dog worst year for WCW. Ratings were in free fall and in desperation, WCW turned out the most epileptic product possible, adding dozens of storylines every week, dropping half of them the next week while adding eight more, switching belts, vacating them, anything to pop a quick shock rating, with the Nadir being slapping the belt on Dewey from Scream on an episode of King Thunder. Then, because it was WCW, they turned him heel at Slamboree, because in for a penny, in for a handful of sh**. Arquette swerved the fans, explaining that he'd been heel and not really Diamond Dallas Page's friend the whole time. Utterly ludicrous stuff, but it is worth pointing out that David Arquette donated all the money he earned from his WCW run to the families of Owen Hart, Droz, and Brian Pillman. He's actually one of the industry's biggest faces. And number one, Andy Kaufman. The original, the best. When you see SmackDown karaoke, it's easy to forget that some of the most off-the-wall and influential artists of our time have been pro wrestling fans. There's something about how camp and surreal it is, how it bends and flirts with reality. Andy Warhol, Billy Corgan, Jim Carrey, he became a fan when researching to play one of the most iconic wrestling fans. The former SNL performer was a perfect match for pro wrestling as his comedy often derived from hoaxing crowds, making them question his actual intentions, playing with tension and disbelief, and also being a massive obnoxious asshole. Being a cocky head heel in the wrestling ring is great fun. I can attest to that much. Kaufman used to wrestle women on the indie scene, calling himself the intergender champion and garnering massive heat for it. It all came to a head when he wrestled Jerry the King Lawler in Memphis. Years before WrestleMania and celebrities becoming the darlings of the wrestling world, Kaufman was a despised Hollywood outsider heel, feuding with Lawler, and the two took part in many angles, including Lawler quotes, breaking Kaufman's neck with a pile driver spot, and of course that famous appearance on David Letterman, where Kaufman got slapped out of his chair by the King before under unleashing a tirade of swears. The feud was so great and Kaufman was such a pro, he went to his grave without admitting it was a work. Or was it? No, I'm just kidding. Andy Kaufman's definitely still alive. And that's our list. Did we miss out any famous wrestling celebrity heels? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe to WrestleTalk for more news and lists. And never forget to jam that jam.